Hi, I'm Hazel, and today I'm going to be talking about Sawzall, a racket library I've created for manipulation of structured tabular data. First, we'll take a look at how Sawzall acts on some standard data sets. In particular, to start off this talk, we'll take a look at the general social survey from the year 2016. This data has various individual level preferences about different people. For example, we know that there is a male in the Northeast that is between the ages of 34 and 49 by looking at the first row. Let's say we want to get the percent religious preference by census region. So, we want to know, for example, what percentage of people in the Midwest are Catholic, at least in the context of this data. Well, this data doesn't immediately provide that, so we have to do some transformations. First, we start off with our individual level data, and then we want to summarize it down to count by region of religious preferences. So, we take all of the Midwest Catholics and turn them into a single number representing how many there are. Then, we would take those and turn them into our desired percentage by taking them and dividing them by the total. So how will we do this with Sawzall? First off, we load in our data with a threading operator, which effectively acts like compose, and then we group it with respect to big region and religion. This doesn't do anything initially, but it tells Sawzall's future operations how to act on this data. Then, we create a new variable count that depends on the variable big region and compute its length. Because we told Sawzall about the grouping earlier, this then sums within each region and within each religion. We can then create a new variable frequency depending on count that takes the e count of each individual religion and divides it by the total in that region. And then create a new variable percent depending on our frequency that just multiplies it by 100. And we have our percentages. We can then use Graphite, another library for Racket that's designed to integrate with Sawzall and the kind of tabular data that we're working with here to plot this. So, we take in our data, saved as religion by region, we map the x-axis to religion, the y-axis to percent, and facet on the variable big region, and we use the call renderer to tell Graphite to draw a bar chart. We can now gain some reasonable insight from this data. For example, we now know that, at least in this data set, Protestant respondents in the South greatly outnumbered any others. So what is Sawzall? Sawzall is a racket library for data manipulation, that's designed to act like map, filter, and fold, but for structured data, rather than something like a list or a vector. It's designed to be compositional, using the threading operator, which is effectively just compose. It's inspired by the R packages dplyr and tidier, part of the tidyverse, an R software package created by Hadley Wickham for data science. So what is tidy data? The problem is that when you implement something like map, filter, and fold over structured data, structured data can take many shapes, including an incomprehensible Excel spreadsheet. So, the idea behind tidy data is that data frames are just a record of vectors, and we work with data by variable, so you should be able to get a single variable by just selecting from the record. To accomplish this, we make three assumptions. Every column must represent exactly one variable, every row must represent exactly one observation, and every cell must represent exactly one value. These three assumptions are the language that all of Sawzall's operators speak. Therefore, it's the key thing that we end up abstracting over. Most of Sawzall's wrangling pipelines have four different operators. Create, which adds new variables that depend on existing variables. So for example, we have the new variable total, that is the sum of the adult and juve columns on the left data, producing the column in the right data. This acts similar to map. Slice, which picks columns to retain based on their names. Here, we use the slice pattern containing T to remove any columns that do not satisfy this from the left. Where, which picks rows to retain based on their values. Here, we filter down rows that contain an adult value that, are, that is greater than 3, so anything that doesn't satisfy that is read out. And finally, aggregate, 
which reduces many values down to a summary. So we can create a new variable as a function of adult that is just this length. But this doesn't seem very useful in, on its own. Like, we're just taking all of our data and turning it into a scalar. And while that may be sometimes what you want, aggregation and creation and all of these other operators are more powerful than that. The idea is that a lot of these data manipulation tasks happen in groups. Referring to our GSS example within the group region. So, we can compose our existing operators with grouping to avoid repeating ourselves. Here, we aggregate down the adult column into its sum and the juve column into its sum. But, we can work with respect to the group GRP, and then Sozzle only works in the context of these groups. In addition, these groups stack, so if we add another group TRT, Sozzle will then permute on all of the possibilities of these groups. Next, we'll take a look at what happens when you get data that's out in the wild and maybe not as good as our GSS example. In particular, our GSS example was actually pulled straight out of a data science textbook. It's pretty much as good as data can be. But what happens when you have data that's actually pulled from a real source? It's probably not going to be tidy. Here, we'll take a look at the Billboard Top 100 data from the year 2000. So, we can know by looking at the first row that Baby Don't Cry by Tupac ranked 87th in its first week after release. The problem, though, is that this data isn't tidy. We have all of these WK columns, which are actually values of the variable week. So how do we deal with that? Sozzle doesn't know how to speak this language. Well, to fix it, we use Sozzle again. In particular, what we really want to do is take all of our WK columns and turn those names into the values of a variable week. Then take all the values that are in those columns and turn them into values of a variable ranking. So, use the pivot longer operator to accomplish this. We take all of the things matching the pattern starting with WK, and we turn their names into a variable week and their values into a variable ranking, preserving the order. Then, we drop the WK prefix from the string and turn it into a number to make it easier to deal with while graphing. We now have tidy data, so let's try and do some analysis with it. In particular, let's say we're big fans of Blink-182, and we want to see how they did in the year 2000. We can use the where star operator, which acts like where, but it uses a match pattern, and filter down to all of the ones where the artist is Blink-182. We have all of these hash Fs in the ranking, though. What's up with that? Well, that's saying that Blink-182 was 89th in week 1, but they weren't on the charts at all in week 76. We can use the drop NA operator on the ranking variable to get rid of all these hash Fs, and the reorder operator on the variable week to sort it in a way that makes sense. Finally, we can use graphite again, mapping the x-axis to the week, the y-axis to the ranking, and making a line plot, lower being better. And we can now know that Blink-182 peaked at week 12 of its release by looking at this graph. So, similarly to wrangling, tidying data has four key operators. Unlike wrangling, though, these are more like families of operators, rather than individual runs. In particular, Perhaps the most important is the pivot operator, which changes the shape of the data to be longer or wider. As we can see here, we can take the variables A and B using the slice pattern AB, and turn their names into the variable cat site and their values into the variable catch. We call this lengthening the data because it is quite literally adding more rows and making it longer. Similarly, there's a wider operation that goes the opposite direction. Unnest, which spreads out nested structure like lists into multiple variables. Sozzle doesn't know how to deal with lists or vectors or hashes, at least not on its own. So the unnest operator can spread out these into their own variables so we can then deal with them. Here we have hash tables in the input data, so we can spread it out with the unnest longer operator. Separate, which spreads out strings into multiple variables. 
For example, if you want to do date processing, you could use this to parse down the date into multiple year, month, day variables, and work with it from there. Finally, reorder, which sorts the data according to some variable or comparator. Here, we take the data on the left and sort it backwards by the adult column. Finally, let's take a look at how Salsal works under the hood. In particular, most of Salsal's individual operators are actually macros, and all of them, function or macro, have the signature data frame to data frame or some kind of wrapper structure, like a group data frame, to represent grouping. The consistency of all of these operations without any side effects means that these operations compose with the pipeline operator, and we found that this results in a very natural do this then that flow to programs. In addition, Racket is really good at writing down what you want to write and figuring it out later. In particular, aggregate and create and all of these forms have syntax that doesn't really follow Racket's standard model. But we don't care. We can just write down whatever we want and then make macros do the heavy lifting later. Ultimately, I found that this meant that I could express what I wanted to in the most ergonomic way I could, and then work it out later. In addition, Sossel uses a lot of these things called syntax class DSLs. Racket preaches language-oriented programming, but sometimes you want languages within hashlang Racket without having to use a separate one. Syntax classes from syntax parse let you parse embedded DSLs at compile time. So also use these extensively for various operators that actually speak their own domain-specific language, namely the slice operator, which follows the grammar you see here. As you can see, some of these actually have conflicts with racket functions, but we don't care. At compile time, we use the syntax class called slice spec, and it takes all of our slice patterns and turns them into a structure that a regular function can take. In particular, we parse everything to everything s, and containing to containing s, etc., and it's all defined as a recursive structure. So what's Sozzle already good for? Processing small in-memory datasets, like the ones in this talk, or the ones on the right, which represents New York City flights in 2013, already works pretty well. In addition, basic relational processing, like joining data, works very well as well. Basic data science tasks can be completed, including the overwhelming majority of introductory textbooks, like Hadley Wickham's book, are for data science, in conjunction with the math library. In addition, I've been kind of hand-waving around Graphite. Graphite's this whole other library created to work with this for visualization, and there's also a Scheme Workshop talk about that, if you'd like to know more. With future directions for the project, Feature parity with R and the tidyverse is a non-goal. Those projects have had a ton of time to develop, and ultimately, features will be added as people want to use them. In addition, performance still leaves a lot to be desired, which is why processing very large datasets may not be a great fit right now. This also works super well when working with a single data frame, but relational data, like joining, could work better and more fluidly. Finally, Salsal is currently dependent on Alex Harsanyi's data frame library, but ultimately we're not really relying on any of the specifics, and it could be abstracted away from it. This could be a generic interface, possibly even interfacing with real databases or other means of storing tabular data. Salsal is more generally useful than just the examples and anecdotes I've shown in this talk. If you'd like to know more, please check out our GitHub repository and guided tutorial. Thanks to Kieran Healy's excellent data visualization textbook and Hadley Wickham's R for Data Science textbook for providing a plethora of examples, not only for this talk, but also to benchmark Sawzell and Graphite against. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Hazel. <clears throat> yeah, hi. <laughs> um, so Hazel, let's start off. Can you tell me like, why you decided to make this project. I mean, um, I, I feel like you've, you, you know, you, you showed why it's cool and what, and what it does, but like, uh, why, why do you personally care about this? Um, so, well, uh, initially I cared about it because my advisor told me to care about it. But aside from that, um, 
it's so a lot of like PL papers, et cetera, end up using Racket and end up having to typeset like performance graphs or various other things. And um, the initial motivation was that um, in order to make these performance graphs, we would have to use like the plot library and then you would have to turn this into a format that the plot library understands. And you had like this giant mess of code that you end up having to create in order to make these plots. That's where Graphite came in and we said, okay, we can go look at the actual like realm of data science and see how to make this more ergonomic. And then once Graphite was in a reasonable state, we realized that this is more generally useful than just like making data in the code and then plotting it. It's actually possible to take code from the wild and then work with it there. The problem with data in the wild is that a lot of it is messy and a lot of it doesn't give you the insight that you want, which is why Sozzl exists now. And even beyond that, a lot of people have used this for like actual like data processing, like they get something messy from like some internal tool and then use it to tidy it. So it's even more generally useful than I initially envisioned. So cool. So um, I think that's very interesting because, you know, you basically had like a really particular itch of a, you know, PO kind of person. <laughs> I want to make these to performance graphs. And now, um, you know, rather than just uh, being a bad programmer and copy and pasting a lot of code and, you know, just sort of one-offing it, you said, okay, well, how can we make uh, something beautiful? And maybe, you know, you're leveraging a lot of what people have done in the, uh, the R data processing world. Mm -hmm. uh, now, those primitives that you talk about, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a data processing idiot, okay? So if I go read that book, are they going to talk about all the exact same primitives that you are talking about? Or are you adding, you know, some special uh, PL sauce there? Um, so it's pretty much like a lot of the things in dplyr and tidy or dr libraries are called the things that they are because the existing operator names that they would actually want to use were already part of the R programming language. So right. more or less, you can kind of just take like the R operator names and the R operator syntax mm -hmm. and then say, okay, what does this actually mean? And then you usually get the Sozzle operator. Um, in terms of other things, a lot of times uh, some of the R operators had like really weird semantics to them. So you like if that? you look through the like um, data visualization textbook that I mentioned from Karen Healy, um, there was one particular example where like, I believe a variable n was simultaneously bound to like a number and a vector and the resulting code was extremely confusing. Um, so like basically you can think of the majority of Sussex operators as a slightly more verbose and slightly more direct version of the R operators where things don't get magically bound in random places. I see, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll call that more principle. <laughs> whatever you want to call it yeah um now so here's a few little questions um i think that uh some people don't know why you named it sawzall uh, i feel like that this is kind of like an american brand thing w will you just explain again what a, why it's called sawzall sawzall is another name for a reciprocating saw a reciprocating saw cut stuff this cut stuff yeah and isn't it isn't it just a, like an american brand a sawzall because it saws everything, it saws all. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, it was actually Sam TH who came up with the name for this. Yeah. I came up with the name for Graphite, uh, but he came up with the name for this. So maybe probe him for more questions on that one. But my my wife loves her saws all. It was a uh, it was one of you know the best uh, best Mother's Day gifts I ever got her. Um, now, uh, is there any hope for doing this in a typed way? And what would that even mean? to do types for something like this. Uh, so for instance, obviously there's like data frame is just a thing, but then, you know, I imagine that there are certain primitives that you use that would break if the data wasn't formatted correctly. Is there hope of doing it so that that is a type interaction? I have, uh, actually this is a question that I already got and the answer is I feel like the definition of what tidy data is despite the fact that I give it as these invariants, right? Um, ultimately, there's not really a good way for a computer to look at data and say this is tidy or this is not tidy 
aside from like having lists or vectors and hashes in it, then you could maybe automatically expand that. But I don't really think that there is a good way of getting a computer to recognize that. Like, for example, all of the WK columns and like the billboard example, there is no reasonable way without like, I don't know, like random machine learning garbage or something weird um, to tell the computer, like, these are actually values of a variable rather than actually being the variables that you want. So in short, I have no idea. Uh, but <laughs> so I feel like you answered the question, is there a yeah. like type directed or generic way to automatically do some of the things that Sawzall does? And I think that I might be asking a more mundane question, which is, um, I am going to call one of your operators and I accidentally give it a number. Okay, I want this to error. Presumably this is easy, but maybe it's a little bit harder to say that I want to, um, you know, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an operation that requires, I don't know, like a data frame with three elements and, oh, I accidentally gave you one that only has two elements and I want to catch that error at compile time. Um, are these interesting or hard problems or is it just like boring and you haven't done it? Um, it's, I, so one thing is that if we're talking specifically about like the exact shape of data with regards to the number of columns and rows, that's like one of the few things in my mind that dependent typing is really good for uh, is because that like the prototypical example of like a dependent type is like a length indexed uh, oh, yeah. like vector. So that wouldn't be that hard to generalize to matrices. And that's honestly probably like we've, we've done a solid amount of work there. Um, how that applies to Sawzall, I don't know, because again, like... It, it still requires a, like a human to really understand what the invariants you want out of the lengths are. Um, and moreover, when I talk about the shape of the data, what we really care about is tidiness and that's really difficult to measure, so. So maybe a, kind of your answer is, uh, yeah, you might be able to enforce these things, but what's the point? Because you're just gonna, you're really gonna duplicate all the information that's already in your program anyways. And the whole point of this is that you're kind of doing some sloppy, uh, you know, tidying up in the first place and types, you know, type based programming has this, uh, you know, idea where you're doing a lot of thinking beforehand about what it is and that doesn't really work with tidiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of feel like all of tidiness, but not the input to tidiness. Yeah, I kind of feel like the a lot of the point behind this is the, the kind of exploratory data analysis that you might want to do. Like you might want to just like throw some ideas at your data and figure out what happens and the, the amount of pre-planning that goes into having to write up a specification and a type would be but i'm not going to say that it's impossible to do this in like type bracket and then have like all of that work it's just that i haven't done it so yeah. okay now one of the things that you mentioned is, is that you know it's not performant for big inputs and that kind of thing like what is the reason for that is it that like R does some really cool uh, thing. You know what I mean? Like, is it like a deep reason? Is it a boring reason? Is it something that you care about fixing? Can you kind of, you know? It is It is uh, something that I care about fixing. Ultimately, I feel like, um, first off, um, again, like the R and Julia library is for similar tasks. I've had a lot of time to develop and I haven't. And that, and also I, am ultimately a second year undergrad and I am not great at optimizing things. Uh, but I do think that it's something that could definitely be resolved. Um, I also feel like there are probably maybe more clever ways of storing the data internally or maybe more clever ways of not having as many intermediaries. Like especially when doing stuff with groups, there's a lot of copying that ends up going on in the background. So I'm hoping to maybe reduce that and do stuff in place, but yeah. Like there's nothing inherent to it that makes it unperformant. It's just that there is optimization that needs to be done and I am busy, but. So um, it would this be a valid way to characterize what you said, which is that you haven't really tried to optimize it. You know, you weren't trying to be dumb, but you haven't also said, okay, I'm gonna do this amazing tool optimization. And let's say for instance, if we look in R, like, I don't know, Maybe we know that the data is only loaded one time into one giant matrix. And then what really gets passed around 
are like slices that record, you know, where to go look in the original data. And you're not doing any cleverness like that. You're just actually, you know, manipulating lists of stuff. And so you're kind of doing it in the most obvious way. And it's unsurprising mm -hmm. that that isn't performance. Yeah, I mean, that's part of it. Although, funny thing, you should mention the slice stuff with regards to, like, grouping, because that is actually something that I do. But uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, there's definitely just, I, I feel like most of it is just, there's too much copying going on. But, hmm. yeah. Now, uh, do you think that the, do you think that the, the type question is related to the performance at all? Or do you think that's just a, a red herring? I don't know. By the way, is that R, they're not typed right. Uh, yeah. They're, they seem like a big giant hack job. So I would not anticipate that uh, pervasive use of types is what, uh, is, what is helping them. Yeah. And that and like the Julia library, which is occasionally more like convenient than, like, or not more convenient, not like more performance than the R library words. Um, that is quote unquote typed, but again, they're not really storing any tidiness information. They're not really storing any uh, like dimension information like in the types. Um, so, and they're still relatively performant. So I don't think that that's the approach that I would want to take, though it is definitely an interesting one. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much, uh, Hazel. Uh, I'm gonna clap for the whole audience now. Uh, you guys can all, uh, you know, send clap icons. Uh, which people are doing. Well, um, I feel so appreciated. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you gotta look at the YouTube log later and you'll see everyone clapping. <laughs>